All right, so in uh, 1 Kings chapter 19, what I want to focus on here is going to be at the, the last part of this chapter. We see Elijah, this is right after he got done doing his great miracle of, um, you know, the, he, call, he, had, he had Ahab call together all the prophets of Baal and they were both going to do it, perform a sacrifice. And he said, this is going to settle it once and for all. You know, let the God that answers by fire be the God, be the true God that we worship. And um, he let them, you know, dress their, their animal, their sacrifice. And, and they were, you know, spending all day trying to, trying to get their God to, to take the sacrifice. And, of course, it didn't happen because they were worshiping false gods that weren't real gods. And then um, Elijah, you know, poured water all over his three times and um, did all kinds of things that where it would be completely impossible for, for humanly speaking, for that fire to consume the sacrifice. But he did, uh, God answered and he, and he, you know, consumed the sacrifice and everything. And that's after that happened, the whole, all the people saw that. It was a major event. And Elijah had all the, the prophets of Baal killed. And this is right after this happened. So now he gets he has a real high point in his ministry because it was a, it was a great victory, it was a great success. But then right after that, we see um, Jezebel is gonna is gonna go after him and persecute him and, and wants to kill him now because she was a, a Satan worshiper just like all the other prophets of Baal were, and she was upset that that he had them all killed, and um, she didn't care about the truth. She just wanted him dead and now he's fleeing and, and he's just upset and he gets real depressed. He gets down and he goes to God and he says, God, you know, I just want to die. I just, just take my life from me. You know, nobody here, you know, I'm, I'm trying to do what's right and nobody seems to be listening. Nobody seems to care. And this is a point that, um, you know, any, any of us can get to in our lives as Christians. You might feel like, you know, I go out soul winning, I try to preach the gospel to people, I try to talk to my friends and family, they just think I'm crazy, nobody wants to listen, the world just keeps getting worse and worse, and you just kind of throw up your hands and say, what's the point? And you get depressed. But we don't want to ever fall into that type of an attitude and have that defeated type of an attitude. Now, was God done with Elijah here? Absolutely not. God was not done with him. He had a lot more work to do. And honestly, what happens is, he said in this story, you know, there's still 7,000 people that haven't bowed their knee to Baal. There's still 7,000 people out there. You may feel like you're alone, Elijah, but you're not. You may feel like nobody else believes this way. No one else is worshiping the true God. He says, but there's 7,000 people out there that still do. And unfortunately... What happens, and this is similar to where we're at today, is that those 7,000, the reason why he doesn't know they're there is because they're keeping silent. Inside, they believe right. Inside, they know the truth. But they're not expressing that outwardly. They're scared. Maybe they're ignorant of a lot of things. And they don't, they don't say anything. So you have a man of God like Elijah who's proclaiming the word of God who's not afraid, who's not ashamed of the Word of God, and he's going to preach the Word of God as he was called to do, but he's getting no encouragement, no edification, nothing from anybody else because he doesn't even know they're there. He thinks he's the only one left. Now, <clears throat> we see here then that God sends him and he tells him, you know, you're going to anoint Jehu to be king, and you're also going to go get Elisha. He's going to be your, um, your successor, basically. He says he's going to be in your room um, it, to be the prophet in thy room, is what he said about Elisha. And um, that's all kind of by way of introduction. But it's all relevant to what I'm going to be preaching about this morning. Because I want to focus here on when he goes and meets Elisha. How does he, what does he find Elisha doing? This is a man that, that God has anointed. Elisha doesn't even know it yet. But we see some very important characteristics of Elisha when Elijah goes and meets him, when he goes to call him. Look down at verse number 19. It says, So he departed thence and found Elisha the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him, and he with the 12th. 
And Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. So what we see here about Elijah is he was a, he was a hard working man. He was plowing land with 12, 12 yoke, uh, or um, yeah, 12 yoke of oxen. And he was with the 12th yoke. Said he was actually plowing with the 12th yoke. He got in there. He got in the yoke and he got in there and, and was helping to plow as well. And he was giving it his all and, give, and using his might and his strength to work. And um, <clears throat> when, when he was called, well, we'll get into that in just a second. God likes a hard worker. Okay, we see Elisha here was working very hard when Elijah came to call him. And Elijah at this point, I don't even think, even knew that God was calling him to do anything in his life. He was already a hard worker. And these are the people who God wants to use. God wants to, wants to use people who are hard workers, who aren't afraid to get their hands dirty, who aren't afraid to go out and do the work. And we saw in Genesis 2 just last Wednesday, when we preached on this, that, that God had a job for, even for Adam, even before he sinned. Before sin entered into the world, before the curse came and, and things were made a lot more difficult for him, God had a lot of work, had work for Adam to do. He was supposed to dress and to keep the garden when, they was, when he was still in the Garden of Eden. And um, God has a lot of work for us to do today. Now, we could take comfort in the fact that we don't have to do it alone. God promises that he'll be here with us. And he's given us his words for our instructions so that we know what we're supposed to do. And he has given, us an, his, has given us himself as an example as well to follow. So you say, well, I don't know what God's will is in my life. Well, guess what? It's all written in this book. It's all found in here. God's will for your life can be found within these pages. And that's the same for everybody. This isn't like astrology where you have some special horoscope depending on the day. And this is only supposed to be for you. Right? If your birth date is this day, this year, this is you, what your special path is. No, that's not the way the Bible works. God's will in your life is found right here. God's will in everybody's life is found right here. He gives us all the answers. He gives us all the information that we need to know ahead of time. He tells us right here. He gives us the instructions, how to do it, and what he expects of us to do. And he expects us to be hard workers as Elisha was. Now notice too in this story, when Elisha was called to go and do God's work, Look at how he responded to that call. He was, he was completely all in. Now he asked, he asked Elijah, he said, hey, can I go back and, you know, just say goodbye to my mother and my father? And, um, and he's like, and I'll follow you. So Elijah's like, yeah, sure, go back. You know, go back again for what have I done to thee? But look at what he does when he goes back. Look at verse number 21. It says, and he returned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slew them. So one of the yoke of oxen he was using to plow the land, right? These are the, 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 the oxen that he needed to do the work that he had been doing, to do the, the work that, that he had been doing in his life up to this point. He took a yoke and he slew them. And it says he boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen. Elisha's leaving behind that work and that past and everything that he did by, by using the, the instruments to burn the water, to boil the flesh. It's symbolic. It's showing us here that he's not going back to that trade. He's not going back to that type of a work. He's, you know, in a sense, he's burning his bridges behind him. He was plowing and using, and he needed all those oxen if he was in with the 12th. He needed the 12 yoke. But he slew the yoke of oxen, he burned the instruments, and you know, fed his mother and father and, and, and said goodbye, and went off to serve God. And Elisha turned out to be a great man of God as well. And God likes to see the hard worker, the laborer, that's going to do the work for the Lord and who isn't going to look back. Who's going to be able to say, okay, you know what, I'm done with that. You've called me to do this work. I'm done with it. I'm going to do what, what you have for me to do, God. And that's the way we all need to look at our life. Um, sometimes it's not our, our actual, sometimes it is our jobs that we're doing that we need to get, get away from. Uh, maybe we're doing something that, that isn't pleasing unto God. But even if it's not that, sometimes if you're called to preach, if you're called to be a pastor or a preacher, you know, you need to be able to, to get rid of the, the, the life that you had been living to serve the Lord. 
Everybody, though, regardless of what it is that you're going to do, when you serve God, you have to make sacrifices. You're going to have to give up something. Your, your life is going to have to change from what you had been used to if you decide, I'm going to go and serve the Lord. I'm going to go and do what's right. The way that your life had been before has to change, and you're going to be making sacrifices. Turn, if you would, to Lamentations chapter 3. The title of my sermon this morning is Get in the Yoke with Jesus. So we're going to see a few references to the yoke. And to, um, you know, if, if you don't know what a yoke is, a yoke is placed, it's a, I don't know how to describe it, like a piece of wood or metal. And they would put the oxen's head through the yoke and they would attach, you know, with ropes or whatever to the, to the instrument or the tool that you're going to use to plow. And typically you'd have, you'd have a pair. You'd have two oxen or two animals tied up together to get to, to work as a team together to, to give you the most strength um, for what you're doing. So we're going to see some references to bearing a yoke. And um, Lamentations chapter 3, if you're there, look down at verse number 27. The Bible says, It is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. He sitteth alone and keepeth silence because he hath borne it upon him. So it says right here in verse 27, it's good for a man to bear the yoke in his youth. Why is it good to bear a yoke in your youth? Because you're young, you're strong, you know, you probably don't have any injuries, you're, you're healthy. You've, it's, it's the prime time to be able to get the work done. Not only that, it's good to start learning to be a hard worker when you're young. And girls, you need to listen up to this. God likes to see a hard worker. God doesn't want you to be lazy. He doesn't want you to sit around. He wants you to help around the house. He wants you to do work. He wants to see you busy accomplishing things. And when he sees you doing even just the smallest of things, even if it's something as simple as picking up your room or doing your chores or um, just doing anything, and, and this is applicable to everybody's life, if you want God to use you First, be responsible, be a hard worker in the little things, in the things that aren't that big of a deal. Because if God sees you working hard with that, he knows that. He says, okay, if you're going to work hard with that, I'm going to give you some real th things to do, some, some more important things to do. Because he'll be able to trust you and you've already proved yourself that you're a hard worker. And if you want to be used by God, it's good. He says it's good for a man to bear, that he bear the yoke in his youth. You want to learn from a young age to be a hard worker. To be someone who's not lazy. Let's keep reading here because this is important as well. Verse 29 says, He putteth his mouth in the dust. If so be, there may be hope. The same man that, that bears the yoke puts his mouth in the dust. What does that say? Is he's, he's real low to the ground. He's lowly and he's humble. Verse 30, He giveth his cheek to him that smiteth him. He is filled full with reproach. The job isn't easy. The job might come with, um, it's going to require you to be humble. And it says, this is very similar in the New Testament. He gives his cheek to him that smiteth him. Right? Jesus Christ says, and whosoever shall smite, smite thee on the cheek, you know, turn, basically turn the other cheek. So he smite you on the other cheek. Um, that, that comes right here in Lamentations chapter 3. We have the same teaching. He is filled full with reproach. For the Lord will not cast off forever, but though he cause grief, Yet will he have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. Now, think about bearing a yoke. You think about it, it's easy to think about an ox and do it because you don't worry so much about the animal, about if it's uncomfortable or how that feels on them. I mean, you do to some extent, but it's still an animal. It's a work animal. That's what it's there to do. You're not going to be too concerned about whether or not that's exactly what that animal wants to be doing at the time. But for you bearing a yoke, and putting that work instrument around your neck, that's not going to be comfortable. And serving God isn't going to be comfortable. Many times you're going to have to be doing things. You may be facing persecutions. You may have to turn the other cheek. You may have to you know, have your mouth in the dust, so to speak, when you're serving God. And it's definitely going to be work, and it's going to require strength to do the work. 
You need to make sure you're strong and strengthened in God's Word and in the Lord and, and you know, continue to work. Maybe you're not able to handle as much today, but keep at it because the more you do now, the, more, the, the even more you'll be able to do later. You'll be able to, to build up your strength and to grow stronger and stronger to do more and more. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 11. We're going to see what Jesus said about taking his yoke. Matthew 11, verse number 28, we see a, a big similarity to what we just read in Lamentations 3. And actually, keep your finger in Lamentations 3 because we're going to be going back to Lamentations in just a minute. Um, Matthew chapter 11, verse number 28 says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. See, Jesus Christ is our rest. But he says in verse 29, Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me. So he's giving us a job to do. Take my yoke on you. Here's my yoke. I want you to wear it. I want you to bear it. I want you to do this work. And he says, and look at me and learn of me. Learn from me. Learn what I'm doing. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. So he says, learn of me. And right after he says, I'm meek. I'm lowly in heart. In order to do God's work, we need to have a humble attitude because as I just mentioned, it's going to come with persecutions. And this is exactly lines up with what we saw in Lamentations chapter three. But Jesus tells us in verse number 30, he says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So in God's, from God's perspective, in God's eyes, you know, taking his yoke upon you, it's not that difficult. He says, the job I have for you to do, he says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, um, <clears throat> I think this is especially true when you compare the yoke that Jesus has for you compared to the yoke of sin and bondage. So flip back, if you would, to Lament Lamentations. We're going to look at chapter number one this time. Because the yoke of sin and transgression is heavy. That yoke of sin is hard. It's not an easy thing to bear when you're bearing the, the yoke of, of a sinful and wicked life. The yoke of God is much easier than that. He's called us to work. We need to be strengthened. It may be a little bit uncomfortable, but he says, my yoke is easy. Lamentations chapter 1, look at verse number 14. The Bible says, the yoke of my transgressions is bound by his hand. They are wreathed. Wreathed means they're like braided. They're worked together. You think of a, of a Christmas wreath. People put these wreaths on their door. They're just branches woven together. So he says, The yoke of my transgressions is bound by his hand. They are wreathed and come upon my neck. He hath made my strength to fall. The Lord hath delivered me into their hands from whom I am not able to rise up. The Lord hath trodden underfoot all my mighty men in the midst of me. He hath called an assembly against me to crush my young men. The Lord hath trodden the virgin, the daughter of Judah, as in a winepress. For these things I weep, mine eye, mine eye runneth down with water, because the comforter that should relieve my soul is far from me. My children are desolate because the enemy prevailed. When you're bearing that yoke, of your transgressions and of your sins, when you get into a sinful and wicked life and you, you turn away from God and you start walking in the flesh, that is a heavy yoke to bear. That is when your strength is going to fail you. That's when you're going to look for that rest. Remember, Jesus Christ is our rest. You're going to look for that rest and for that comfort and you're not going to find it because you're walking in wickedness, you're walking in sin. It's going to be a life of sorrow of being beaten down and trodden down. The Bible says, you know, because the comforter that should relieve my soul is far from me. You're not going to have that comfort. You're not going to have any joy when you're living that wicked, sinful life. And he says, my children are desolate because the enemy prevailed. And the enemy prevails when you disobey God and get into sin because that's what Satan is constantly trying to get you to do. He's tempting you and trying to get you to do things against what God has commanded. But Jesus says his yoke is easy and his burden is light. We need to follow that. We need to make sure we're, we're hard workers. And um, 
understand what that work is that's laid out for us. Now I'm going to cover one thing that's probably the most important thing as far as working and doing good work for Christ. And this is something that everybody should be doing. Every saved person in the world. I don't care if you're man, woman, boy, or girl. Everybody needs to be taking this burden on themselves because it's not restricted to anyone. Pastoring a church is restricted. There's some qualifications for that. Doing other jobs within the church have their own restrictions. Being a deacon, even playing instruments in church, playing the piano, whatever it may be, there's restrictions, there's talents, there's other things that you need to have. But the one thing that we all can do is winning souls. Winning souls to Christ, going out and plowing, getting in that yoke, and going out and doing the work that Christ has set out for us as far as preaching the gospel to every creature. Philippians 4, 3 says, And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow. Paul's referring to, to other believers as being yoke fellow, in the yoke together with him doing the work. Help those women which labored with me in the gospel. So we see here again, it's not just for the men. He's talking about the women who labored. They were doing hard work. They labored. How did they labor? They labored with me in the gospel. They didn't labor in the nursery. They didn't labor by vacuuming the floor. They labored with Paul in the gospel. And this is something we all need to be doing, laboring in the gospel, preaching the gospel. He says, with Clement also and with other, my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. Luke chapter 10. Turn to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, we're going to see Jesus sending out his laborers, his workers, putting the yoke on them and sending them out. And remember what we said about the yoke. A yoke is typically you're putting two animals together to do the work, right? It's, it's one and another side by side in that yoke. Luke 10, verse number 1 says, After these things the Lord appointed other seventy also and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. Jesus sent out his disciples by twos, which is one of the reasons why we go out in pairs today when we go out soul winning. There's many reasons for that. One is because if someone has never done it before, they want to learn a little bit about it. We have a silent partner and, and another person who does the talking and you could be teaching people how to do it. But not just that. You're an encouragement for each other, and you're both getting in this yoke together when you're sent out two and two like Jesus did. And look what he said in verse number two. Therefore said he unto them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. And my friends, this is the same problem that we have today. This is the same problem we've had throughout history is that, hey, there's this great harvest. There's all these souls out there just waiting to be saved that need to put their faith in Christ, but the laborers are few. People aren't willing to do the work. People aren't willing to get up and to do something that may be a little bit uncomfortable, to take that yoke and to put it around your neck Instead, they'd rather just sit at home, sit on the computer, sit around and do nothing instead of actually getting up and doing hard work. Jesus Christ said, the harvest truly is great, but the labors are few. Pray, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. The harvest is there. It's ripe. It's ready. Now, what's going to happen to the harvest if you don't have enough laborers? It's not all going to get reaped. If you don't have enough people out there to do the work, some of it's just going to perish. It's never going to get reaped and it's going to die. It's the same exact thing that's going to happen when we don't go out and labor for the Lord to win souls. If you don't go out and do the work, there's a lot of souls out there that are going to die and go to hell. Because nobody decided to answer the God's call to go up, to man up, to do the work, to put the yoke on, and to go out and start preaching the gospel to people. Because I'll tell you what, my friends, if a person never hears the gospel of Jesus Christ, how can they believe? How? How is it possible for a person to believe? 
They can't. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. They need to hear the word of God. People need to be sent. Romans 10 explains that very clearly. That that is why we're sent. Preachers are sent to preach the gospel so people can hear, so they can put their faith in Christ. Don't think that people could get saved any other way than by hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 9, because you have people today, the Mormons are a big one that believe in this, and even other just Reformed, I've heard Reformed theology teaching that, oh, well, you know, God's not unfair, so if someone doesn't hear about Christ, you know, they'll have some extra opportunity after they die to hear about Jesus. My friends, that is a lie. The Bible does not teach that anywhere. The Bible doesn't say that anywhere. It's something that man has made up to make them feel good about being lazy and not going out and doing the work. Because they want to justify their own laziness and their own lack of work of going out and preaching the gospel. No, this work is important and people will die and they'll go to hell if they don't hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. People say, oh, well, what about Paul? Paul got saved when Jesus Christ appeared to him in his way to, on his way to Damascus. Well, we're going to look at that story because that's not what happened. Did Jesus appear to, to Paul? Yes, he did. Did Paul get saved when Jesus appeared to him? No. Did Jesus tell him how to get saved when he appeared to him on the road? No, he didn't. God uses Human beings, he uses us as his instruments, as his servants, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. God is not going to appear specially, specifically to anyone in order to preach them the gospel. That is work that he's given for us to do. Let's look at this story, though, in Acts chapter 9, verse number 3. The Bible says, And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. And suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? So we see Jesus talking to him and just asking him, why are you persecuting me? Verse number five, and he said, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. So Jesus didn't tell him what he needed to do. He didn't tell him how to get saved. He says, you need to go here, and then it's going to be told to you what you need to do. Verse number 7 says, And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. So here we see Paul is apparently still blind. He can't see anything. He says he opened up his eyes, but he didn't see any man. He didn't see anything. They had to lead him by the hand. A person being blind is very symbolic of that person being lost. Paul was not saved at this point. And we're going to see that even further evidence. Jump down to verse number 17 of Acts chapter 9. It says, And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me. Now what do you suppose would happen if Ananias didn't heed the call of God? If Ananias heard and knew, yeah, God, I know you want me to do this, but I've got something else going on. I'm not going to do this work. Paul wouldn't have gotten saved. Look at what he says here. It says, um, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, hath, hath, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. We know that a person doesn't receive the Holy Ghost until they get saved. Paul was not saved, which is why he didn't have the Holy Ghost. He did not receive the Holy Spirit of God because he was not saved yet. Verse number 18 says, And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. He was baptized because he called on the name of the Lord and got saved. 
And God used Ananias to be the one to preach the gospel unto him. He used Ananias to do that. There are no special cases of people getting saved in the Bible. Everybody is saved the same way. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, are there people that got saved directly from Jesus Christ? Yes, when he was alive on this earth doing his ministry. I believe there were, but that's when he was Jesus Christ in, in the flesh as a human being. But after that, there is no way that Jesus is just going to appear to someone and just tell them how to be saved. It doesn't work like that. God has, has used us. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to see the proof of this as well from Scripture that this is our job to do and this is what God expects for us to do. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 18 says, And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. The ministry, that's the ministering unto others. It's our job to minister unto others. The ministry of reconciliation. It's a big word. What does that mean? It's reconciling people to God. It's getting people right with God. It's you going up to someone else and saying, okay, you and God have a problem because you're a sinner. You've broken his laws. You're going to, you have this punishment of hell on your shoulders that you deserve to pay for. But there's a way for you to be reconciled with God for that debt that you owe to be washed away. And that debt that gets washed away through the blood of Jesus Christ. The ministry of reconciliation has been given unto us. Look at verse number 19. It says, To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. So this is saying, hey, when Christ was here, he was reconciling the world unto himself. That's what he did. But Christ isn't here anymore. He's ascended up into heaven. Now he has his ambassadors that are speaking for him, that he can speak through. He sends his ambassadors, and that's why he says, we pray you in Christ's stead, as if Christ were here, because he's not here. We're here in the place of Christ to preach Christ to you, that you could be reconciled unto God. That has been committed unto us. Now, if Christ was still doing that job all by himself, why would he say that that's our job to do? He wouldn't need us. Christ is perfectly capable of doing these things on his own. He doesn't need our help for anything. But if he's committed us, that job unto us, then apparently he wants us to do this, and that's the way that he made it. He's not going to be going out and doing this himself. He's committed that job unto us. The bottom line is if we don't go out and do the work, it simply isn't going to get done. That's how important it is. Jesus isn't going to say, oh, well, nobody's doing this, so I better step in and do this. No. And that's why it's so important you read back in Ezekiel about the watchman and how God will hold you responsible if you don't warn the people from their sins, if you don't warn the people that destruction is coming. They're still going to die from that destruction. If you don't warn people from their sins that they're going to go to hell, those people, they'll still die and go to hell. But God's going to hold you responsible. Because it's our job. That's what he's committed to us, is to go out and to preach the gospel. Now, people often pray for a person to get saved. I hear this all the time. I've been in many churches where, you know, we've got this prayer for salvation. We want to pray that this person gets saved. I've got this, this relative or this friend in my life, and I just want them to get saved, and I pray for them to get saved. Hey, I don't have a problem with people praying that prayer, but I'll tell you what. Why don't you, why don't most of these people, because the vast majority of them don't do anything about it. You could pray until you're blue in the face that someone gets saved, 
But if nobody's going to do the work, if no one's going to put forth the effort of picking up their Bible and approaching that person, even though maybe they might think it's uncomfortable, maybe they might give you a funny look, maybe they might get angry, because they say, oh, I don't want to talk about religion. Oh, I don't want to talk about God. Hey, maybe that'll jeopardize your friendship. Maybe that'll jeopardize your relationship talking about God. But why are you going to sit there and pray for someone to get saved if you're not willing to love them enough to open up the Scripture and show them how to get saved? I don't think God's going to be too open to your prayers if you're not doing the work that He's set forth for you to do. He's going to be looking at you saying, well, why are you praying for that person to get saved? Why don't you just get up and give them the gospel yourself? That's the job I gave you to do anyways. Why are you praying to me to get them saved? Now you can pray for, for a great opportunity to arise. You can pray for God to work in people's hearts. I do this all the time. That God will humble somebody if they're, if they're real proud, if they're lifted up. Whatever the stumbling block is for the people in my life that I am praying for and I want to get saved, I pray that God will make it so that those stumbling blocks are removed. Those are great prayers, but you have to follow that up with preaching the Word. Because if you don't preach the Word, they're not going to get saved. Now, maybe there's people you can't reach because they're just, by distance, they're too far away, or, or maybe they've shut you out and they don't want to talk to you anymore. And, you, know, you can still pray that God will send another person to witness unto them, to preach the Gospel unto them. But I'll tell you what, God's going to be a lot more likely to listen to your prayers if you're going out and trying to be an answer for other people's prayers. you got other people praying that their friends and family and relatives might get saved and that God will send a messenger, hey, why don't you be the person to answer those prayers, that God can use to answer those prayers, to preach the gospel. We need to be out doing this. This is our job. We need to bear that yoke. We need to bear that burden and be a laborer for Jesus Christ and do that work. It's not, ultimately, it's not that difficult. Is it work? Yes. Does it require some work? Yes. Sit down in your seats now. Does it require work? Absolutely. <clears throat> but it's not that hard. Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You just need to be able to get up and do it. Now, the other extremely important point in regards to you know, God using us, God's not going to appear unto someone to get them saved. He needs us to go out and do it, is that we need God when we go out. We can't get people saved on our own. We need His power with us. We need the Holy Spirit working through us or else people will not get saved. This is something you cannot do in the flesh, which is why we have to keep ourselves holy. We have to keep ourselves not walking in the flesh, but walking in the Spirit so that we can be used of God. If you go out to knock on doors or to talk to people, get in conversations, and to preach the gospel... And you're not walking in the Spirit, my friends. You're going to be walking in vain. And you're not going to have any power of God to, to see any souls get saved. <clears throat> Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We're almost done. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. First Corinthians 3, 5 Corinthians 3.5 says, Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So that neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. He said, you know, sometimes you may go out and, and preach in the gospel. Sometimes you might be planting the seed. Sometimes you might be watering that seed. Sometimes you might be digging up the ground. You know, whatever is required to get people closer to understanding the truth and to receiving the truth, you may be doing different things. But regardless, when the increase comes, when that person gets saved, hey, God's the one that gives the increase, the Bible says. And we need to remember that, that it's not just by our own power, 
We need to yield ourselves instruments to God. We need to give ourselves to Him to be used of Him to do His work. We are the tool, we are the instrument that God is using to plant those seeds. That the person might receive those seeds, but God's the one that brings forth life. God's the reason why the people get saved. But He uses us as His instruments to do so. The Bible says, Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, in verse number 8, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. We need to get in the yoke with God. We're laborers together with God. God is using us. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. We're his husbandry. We're his animals. We're the, the oxen that get in that yoke. But God, as Elisha got in the yoke with his oxen, Jesus will get in that yoke with us and work together with us to get people saved and when we're out preaching the gospel to them. And we need to remember that. And also he says here that you know, every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. One more motivation for preaching the gospel besides no one else is going to do it and souls are going, going to hell as a result of people not preaching the gospel. But another aspect, another motivation, incentive for us to do this is that we will be rewarded for it. Never lose sight of the eternal prize that you're going to get by doing the work. It's not in vain. No matter how low you may feel, as Elijah did, thinking nobody's listening, I'm not seeing the results. It's not in vain. I often wonder how many of those 7,000 that hadn't bowed the knee unto Baal are as a result of Elijah, and Elijah didn't even know it. You may be getting results that you don't even realize. But God's word never returns void. It's never in vain to preach the word of God. But you have to be willing to do it. You have to be willing to do the work. We have this flesh that we reside in. This flesh can be wearisome. This flesh can cause us to get tired and to not want to go out and do things and to, to keep us back. And we may have pains and struggles in this fleshly body, but we have to get past those in order to do the work for Christ. We need to be hard workers and to get past this, this earthly flesh that we have because it's, we're only going to be here for a short period of time anyways. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12 is the last place I'm going to look at today. 1 Thessalonians 5.12 says, And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. So he's saying, take note of them. Know these people within the church that labor among you. Pay attention to them. Pay attention to the laborers in church that are going out and doing the work. He says, and those are over you in the Lord and admonish you, verse number 13, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. So within the church, when you see someone who's doing a lot of work, who's going out and soul winning and preaching and witnessing the people, he says, esteem them highly in love. Look to those people especially and give them more honor and respect and praise and, and edify them and build them up because they're doing a good work. Recognize the importance of the work that they're doing and esteem them a little bit higher because they're actually out getting their hands dirty and doing this hard work. Those are the people that the Bible says to esteem higher in the church. The ones doing the work of God because it's not necessarily the easiest of jobs. Jesus Christ said it's easy, but um, it still requires some level of work. It still requires you to go out and do something. And so many people aren't doing it that the people who you should be looking up to in the church, the people who you should be you know, being an example of Roma are the ones that are going out and doing the work, the ones who are separating themselves so that they can be used further by God to do His work.
My plea this morning is that you would get in the yoke with Jesus Christ and do that work. He's willing to work with you. You don't have to do it by yourself. He has the comfort. He is the comforter. He has, he has <clears throat> given us the instruction that we need from His Word. We know what we're supposed to do. Everything now just relies on you. Are you going to do it? Are you going to answer that call? Are you going to work for Christ? Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for giving us such an important job. God, help us not to take this job lightly, that people's souls are at stake, that many people are going to die and go to hell as a result of people who are not willing to take up the job of going out and preaching the gospel to every creature, dear Lord. I pray that you would please build our church, strengthen our church, strengthen all of our members. Help us to be bold in speech, dear Lord. Help us not to succumb to our flesh, but that we would overcome the flesh through the Spirit, that you would strengthen us, strengthen our bodies, dear Lord. Help us to get out there and to do the work you have set out before us. Lord, I pray that you would please remove any spirit of laziness that we might have in ourselves. Help us to keep pushing forward day in and day out and not to lose sight of the goal, not to lose sight of the, of the importance of our jobs. Lord, help us also to esteem those that are doing the work highly, dear God, and to um, encourage them so that they don't get discouraged as Elijah did, dear Lord, but that um, we'd be able to keep pressing forward. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.